This is Soren with Nielsen Seeds again uh, with another webinar recording. Today we're joined by David Kaminsky from Manitoba Egg. Um, he is the provincial pathologist, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, using a long term approach uh, for crop rotation to help combat some disease problems that we could be running into. Um, the reason for this is we're looking to help with long-term sustainability with the crops we are growing today. And um, as you may have noticed, we just launched a video with Tammy Jones as well, trying to use crop rotation for combating weed issues on farm as well. So if you haven't checked out that video yet, uh, go to our website and have a look at it. But uh, I will let David take it away here now and uh, we'll see what we can learn. Go ahead, David. All right, thank you, Soren. Good day, everyone. I'm glad to be here to talk about crop rotations and uh, the implications of rotation on disease within your, the crops that you grow. And I would like to answer the question, can extended crop rotations pay off? I think the short answer to that question is yes. In most cases, they should always. Um, and some of that comes from my long experience having worked with producers over the years. Uh, once I was talking with an organic producer and asking him about his disease concerns. And he said he really didn't have any because he had about a seven year rotation, which included some perennial crops. And so there were not uh, the buildup of residue borne diseases in any of the crops that he was growing. Now there are going to be diseases for which rotation has no real um, benefit in the management. Um, so we'll focus on a few of those, um, but generally we're going to look at what crops are you growing now? Uh, what crops have you gotten away from growing and which might you introduce to your rotation in order to spread out the risk of infection from disease problems. So where are we at today in 2019? Well, I've just gotten back into um, agriculture business after about a six year break when I worked in uh, the tree industry. And so I'm getting familiar with what has changed since I've been away for a few years. And the one thing that I see is uh, a very strong reliance, almost an extreme reliance on two to three crops in rotation. Um, this uh, data that I've got showing here, bar chart shows you the acreage and the percentage of the total acreage this is of annual field crops that are made up by canola, spring wheat, soybean, and the rest of the crops that uh, we grow in rotation. It's data out of uh, Yield, Manitoba. And, oh no, pardon me, this is um, the seeded acres from 2019. So that's a report that comes from Manitoba Crop Insurance partway through the year. And this uh, tells us that three crops are making up more than 80% of the annual field crop acreage out there. That doesn't leave much room for the other crops. Let's look at this a little more closely. And this uh, data is based on yield Manitoba. So it's the harvested area in all of Manitoba in 2018. And we can see that um, both wheat and canola make up about a third of the acreage in Manitoba. Soybean is a crop that is coming on strong lately and now makes up more than 20% of the acreage. And then there is another narrow segment, only 14% left for the other crops that might be grown in rotation. I'd like to compare this for the area um, where Soren, your customers might be. And for that, I've chosen risk area three from the, the, the map in Yield, Manitoba. 
I hope that's appropriate. It's the area that is uh, west of Brandon, kind of to the Manitoba border. That definitely is representative for a large uh, portion of our growers, that's for sure. Okay, I'm glad I chose wisely then. <laughs> so I um, looked a little more carefully at the data there, and it seems in your area then, uh, based on the five-year average over the last little while, um, in risk area 13, you have an even stronger reliance on those two crops. Canola makes up 42% of the acreage and wheat 37. Soybean is grown in your area, but not as much as in the rest of the province. I guess that gets skewed by what we grow in the Red River Valley. Uh, but you're at a similar uh, percentage of other crops that might be grown. So what constitutes those other crops? Oh, before we look at uh, what they are, the other crops, I'm not much of a Twitter user. I have a, uh, my own presence on there, but I, I use it more for following what other people are talking about. And uh, this is something that came up recently, just within the last couple of weeks. Uh, a journalist with um, Real Ag, Lindsay, who I've met many times, asks, what's a crop you used to grow but have either cut out of rotation or drastically reduced acres? And what drove the decision to do so? And here are a couple of answers from a couple of producers that uh, I have met and, and also follow. First of all, Simon Ellis says that Barley has been a crop we have cut. We used to grow a lot on our farm and still it's a good crop for us, but there isn't enough demand anymore. We now grow it one in five years. So it's still on the pallet, but uh, substantially reduced. Gunter Joachim, who's uh, from St. Francis Xavier area, so more in the valley says, Flax, haven't grown it for over 25 years and have no desire to go back to it. It won't yield well, coupled with only average price, no return. So these are some growers' uh, ideas about why they have backed off from some of those crops that may have made up a significant proportion at one time, and now we see them a lot less. I wanna go back to your area, risk area three, and I delved into Yield Manitoba and I went back 10 years to see what are the changes. And canola and wheat have been pretty steady, like they're in a groove. Um, that 42 to 43% for canola and 35 to 37% or higher for wheat. Um, 2011, I point out as an anomaly year if you remember, that was a year that started off way too wet at the beginning, and then there was some flooding. A lot of acreage went unseeded. So um, there was an even stronger reliance on canola that year, or that was one of the few crops that uh, we could get on by seeding by air and various means. And that year it made up 50%. Now we can see that in your area, barley at one time made up a significant uh, acreage, but that has kind of been trending down over the years. And um, as uh, Simon Ellis said, the demand seems to be less for it, uh, whether that's for feed. I know that uh, growers often want to target the more lucrative uh, malt uh, market, but that uh, we seem to be prejudiced against in Manitoba. They say we're too wet here, so we don't get malt quality. And we can also see that flax at one time um, made up a significant portion of the mix, and that has virtually fallen off of the map in your area too. Sunflower has periodically made an appearance, and for one reason or another has come and gone. And oats has been kind of a strong contender all along for an alternative crop. 
Well, I want to jump into the disease implications of the, the main three crops that we're focusing on. And um, we should talk about the diseases that are the most damaging or threatening in terms of loss or the cost of crop intervention might be significant. And with canola, the first one that we have to think about is sclerotinia stem rot. Now, this is one of those diseases that has a wide host range, essentially is all of the um, broadleaf crops. And so that encompasses sunflower, um, field peas, dry beans, uh, soybeans even, and uh, flax could even get infected, although we rarely see that being a problem. The survival structures that this fungus produces, those little black mouse turds called uh, sclerotia, uh, they're very tough and they can hang around in the soil happily for two to three years before they have broken down. And so whenever it's wet, uh, we'll see an impact from sclerotinia, either by the germination of these little mushroom-like structures called apothecia, or we can get a direct root infection in crops like sunflowers and uh, dry beans. I've showed the life cycle here in the soybean crop because that's another one that uh, is susceptible to sclerotinia. Um, when the sclero should germinate as uh, apothecia, they blow off ascospores from their upper surface. These are sexually produced spores and they're windborne. Um, they can't cause an infection directly. They have to use the easy sugars that they find in things like uh, fallen petals. And from there, they launch an attack into the plant. And uh, it's quite a destructive fungus. It has some enzymes which destroy cell walls and uh, cause a complete collapse of the plant material and can spread very quickly in wet conditions. So it was really dry this year. And even so, we found the odd sclerotinia lesion um, in our plots at the diagnostic school. And what we're seeing here, indicated by the blue areas, is where uh, infection has begun from some fallen flower parts. And we, what we're seeing is a complete collapse of the cell tissue. And that's from the enzymes that the fungus produces. On this same canola leaf, we also have a black leg lesion and that's recognized by the black pycnidia, asexual spore producing structures. Um, and you can often have both of these diseases on the same plants. Now black leg is um, just as big of a concern for the canola crop and um, the illustration on the right are the two types of infection. The one um, on the left is a basal stem canker. That is the movement from a leaf into the stem of the disease. And you can again see pycnidia within the lesion. Those are asexually produced spores. They ooze out when it's wet and they're only moved short distances by rain splash. On the right, we have a woody stem piece, which is what's left over after the canola crop is gone. And there we have the development of the sexual stage of the fungus, the pseudothesia. And there, both the woody stem piece that they live on and the pseudothesia themselves, they can last for a couple of years quite happily and are slow to break down. So that's the reason that rotation can be an effective method in minimizing the impact of black blackleg. If we're pushing the rotation, we can actually be selecting for new pathotypes, which can overcome the resistance that um, breeders have built into the crop for us, and that's risky business. Also, if you're pushing the rotation, you'll always have um, last year's canola crop next year, or next door to this year's canola crop. And the sexually produced spores are again wind blown and can move a significant difference. So across the road is no, no issue for them. And you can always be having the disease reintroduced to the crop that way. 
And now this is a, a disease which is becoming uh, an issue for Manitoba. It has been an issue for some time now in Alberta, and it's become an issue in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. That's club root. It's really a soil borne disease and it's moved from place to place in soil. Um, we have been watching its expansion and the area where uh, people listening to this talk will be are generally considered to be areas where there is a lower incidence of the club root spores in the soil, but it doesn't take them long to build up. And every time we grow a canola crop, potentially it can become infected, produce a lot of spores which are left behind when the crop breaks down and be an ongoing problem for the long future. Um, club root has rarely come to our attention through the canola disease survey, but this year, again, it did. Um, the plants you see on the left have some smallish club lesion or club symptoms on side secondary roots. And those are from a low level of uh, inoculum in the soil. Um, this was from a field uh, in the central part of Manitoba uh, where we were just surveying for the other diseases that attack canola and we found club root. That is unusual. It's more often as in the case on the right, where we get a call from a producer saying, I'm pulling plants and finding this really weird looking symptom. What is that? And when we go and look, we find uh, that is club root at a more advanced stage. We're probably talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of spores per gram of soil in areas where we're seeing um, club root like that. Um, that particular sample came from a field where it had a high, very high organic matter content because of peat lenses within the field and it was in those areas where the disease was most pronounced and there also um, was a lower pH around 5.5 um, which is much more favorable to club root and acid soil than a, a neutral or basic soil like many of ours are. Okay, I'm gonna make a big jump and go to the second major crop that uh, you're growing in rotation, and that's wheat. And the most perplexing long-term problem that we have to deal with is Fusarium head blight. Um, in our survey this year, because it was so dry, we found very few fields that had head blight, and yet there is the odd field that had a significant infection. And it always comes from the unique coincidence of heat and humidity at the time that the crop is flowering. And that's why it's usually only a portion of the head that uh, is infected. On the left there, we see some of the asexually produced spores of fungus, which are often an orangey or a pinkish color. And uh, those will not uh, cause new infections the initial infections are again coming from sexually produced spores, which can come from neighboring fields, from corn crop residues or other cereals as well. We do have a risk forecast that we produce during the growing season, and it shows for your area the way things are going. It's a very dynamic forecast, that is, it's constantly changing. So it's important to be checking it periodically and also following the animated GIF that we post that shows the last seven days and the direction that risk is going. Is it up or is it down? I mentioned heat and humidity as two keys to infection. You need uh, temperatures in the range of 15 to 30 degrees and relative humidity above 85%. Now often heat and humidity go in opposition to each other and we have that coincidence of heat and humidity thankfully often for just shorter periods in the day. Now um, in this uh, time period, this was early July um, and the crop was just 
coming out of the boot. And so we were anticipating that flowering period. And we we're seeing that there were only a couple of hours of coincidence of heat and humidity. But after it has rained for some time and we get heat, uh, we can run into those periods where heat and humidity are sustained. And then we have to rely on fungicides for control. Oh boy, now I'm jumping again um, to the soybean crop. Um, that one that uh, you're beginning to grow more of in uh, Western Manitoba. And there is a new pest that we're concerned about in soybean, and that is the soybean cyst nematode. We've been surveying, or Dr. Tenuta at the University of Manitoba has been surveying since about 2012. And um, just in the last year, we have found both higher levels of uh, the cysts by genetic detection or DNA testing of the soil, and also finding some actual cysts infecting plants in fields. Now, these uh, soybean cysts, uh, first of all, it's a microscopic worm that is causing this infection and attacking the plant. Um, you can see those little things that look like white beads along the root near the person's finger, and those are actual soybean cysts. Oh yeah, the arrow points them out. What are nematodes? I mentioned they're microscopic worms, and here is a life cycle. Um, you need males and females for um, fertilization to occur, but once the female is impregnated, she embeds in the root, uh, starts to swell up and produces eggs within her body. Um, even after she dies, her body becomes a tough, um, resistant to break down body that is going to protect those cysts until such time as another soybean crop is grown and the eggs can hatch and find their way to the roots of the plant. So this problem we can think of a lot like uh, club root in canola. It's a soil borne problem. It can stay in the soil apart from living hosts and um, come back to bite us a couple of years down the road. There again are some cysts um, on the soybean root. They're tiny, they're the size of a pinhead. And if you just pull plants, you won't find them. They'll break off of the roots. You really have to dig the plants, wash away the soil material carefully, and then examine microscopically or with the hand lens in order to see them. Do you know how many fields of soybean cyst nematode has been found in Manitoba to date? It's really only a handful of fields, Soren. Okay. Um, but if we look across the line into the states where um, they have been growing soybeans for a lot longer than here, um, we know that it has become a, a major problem for them and works together in concert with some other diseases um, like Phytophthora root rot, for instance, um, and they have a syndrome called sudden death syndrome, which sounds pretty spooky, and it is. Uh, it's really three different things working together, the nematode, that root rot, and another organism. So three things working together in concert. Okay. But uh, thankfully at this point, it's just on our radar. It's not yet in your area, but it's something to think about in um, if we grow that, that crop too often, what are we in for? Well, exactly. That's the whole uh, idea of this, that to try and take a long-term approach and learn from mistakes made elsewhere, pushing crop rotation elsewhere before we have to learn it firsthand and it starts costing money. Yeah. Um, here's a slide that uh, was used by Anastasia in her talk a year ago about um, growing a crop on the stubble of what other previous crops. And it simply shows that growing a crop on its own stubble inevitably uh, reduces the potential yield of that crop because of the residue-borne 
diseases that are lingering on the unbroken down crop material. And uh, there might be some other reasons as well that a yield is knocked back when you're growing on the same stubble. Switching it up, you can see that there are some combinations which are more favorable. Um, growing the cereals on a pulse crop is often beneficial, as you can see with uh, field pea or soybean. And that's often from the readily available nitrogen that comes from the quick breakdown of those crops that have a, a lower carbon to net nitrogen ratio. Um, if you had a heavy residue from another cereal um, that has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio and you're going to have to um, push the envelope a little bit with fertility in order to get the breakdown of that uh, that stubble or um, nitrogen will be tied up in stubble or in that crop residue. Again, I want to focus on um, diseases and um, which ones um, have the potential for carryover from one crop to the other. If you look at this in quadrants, you can see that with the cereals, um, it is cereal diseases that are the problems for those crops. With broad leaves in the lower right hand, it's those um, that are going to be a problem for other crops within the same category. And I've uh, spent some time talking about sclerotinia, also known as white mold in some crops. Um, in the sunflower, it's a particularly perplexing problem. That's why we have four uh, positives there. It can attack the crop in three different uh, timings and in three different ways. Um, we talked about uh, apothecial production and airborne spores getting up onto flowers. That's how head rot can occur. Um, but in sunflower, we also have the potential for a direct root infection. When the sclerotia are close to the tap root, um, they can go in directly. And then you'll have a basal stock rot, which weakens the plants and they fall down. Now, if it's head rot in sunflower, that leaves behind a tremendous load of um, the sclerotia. And uh, so sunflower and canola in rotation are quite a high risk scenario. I haven't talked about some of the other diseases that are residue born, but because um, they're on crops that we're not growing a lot, um, we might not see them, but in barley, net blotch is the disease that we see routinely if we were growing quite a bit of barley. Um, Sometimes with saline fields, for instance, we'll be growing barley more often because it's a little more salt tolerant and net blotch is the disease that we're likely to see. It's fairly well controlled with uh, fungicides and it's unique to that crop. It's not something that you would uh, pick up from the cereals. Now, um, some of the other diseases on other crops like flax, really only has one disease that we see when it's been grown quite a bit, and that's PASMO. And PASMO does not affect any of the other crops, even in the, the broadleaf category. So flax has always been considered a good break crop. I guess the trouble, as Gunter says, is um, not a lot has been done in terms of developing the crop for higher potential yield. That has lagged behind the other crops. And when the prices aren't great, um, what, are, what are my reasons for growing it? Other than to put in something that uh, might have an impact or be able to lengthen uh, the rotation cycle and minimize the impact of some of those residue-borne diseases. Uh, field peas are a crop that's having uh, a, an increase in Manitoba, and that's because of the int interest in pea protein. Um, peas at one time made up a bigger acreage in Manitoba and kind of disappeared for a while. Disease was something about what drove them out of the province, uh, particularly in the Red River Valley. We have a real issue with Ascochyta or the Ascochyta complex, which includes 
Microsphorella blight, uh, but there is also a troublesome root rot called a Phanomyces root rot, which has a very long lived resting spore and um, their experience in Saskatchewan where they grow quite a bit of field pea suggests that you probably need about a six year break in order to have that uh, pathogen break down so it doesn't reinfect the crop the next time you grow peas. Um, since I'm ending up with root rots, I wanna also highlight in soybean Phytophthora root rot. Uh, that is one that is troublesome in wetter years. The last three years have really been dry uh, through most of the season, although we had a very wet fall that interfered with harvest here. Uh, we did not see a lot of Phytophthora over the last few years. But uh, it's another thing that um, is in the soil for some length of time and needs that uh, time to break down. Um, that was my last slide, Soren, and um, I wonder, do you have any questions or are there things that I might have missed as, as risks? That, um, no, I think you've hit the disease problems that we uh, we have or or could have uh, around here anyway we the one thing that maybe we didn't talk so much about do it be what which of these diseases can we combat with uh, with fungicides um, mm. well, we, are, we are used to say if you're, for example fusarium head blight or even sclerotinia um, and those we have we have become accustomed to, we can often put a fungicide on and we seem to fare okay with them. Yes. Um, are we able to rotate fungicides in those, like if you point your finger at Fusarium head blight and uh, Sclerotinia, for example, mm. do we have enough options to rotate fungicides so we don't build up resistance? Um, well, with canola, we're relying pretty heavily on group three products. I think okay. that the three major products that have a lot of use, they're all within that same group. And in wheat as well, uh, the ones that have had the most use up to now have been Greek group three products, but there are some that are just cracking the market now, which are a mix of um, active ingredients. And if you see on the product label that there is more than one um, fungicide grouping that is um, a means of putting off the development of fungicide resistance. Okay. Yeah, that would definitely be helpful. Um, no, I think that's really all I had to add to it. I mean, it's, uh, we're almost, I don't want to say we're driving fear into anybody, but this is a fact finding mission and know what, we're mm -hmm. up against, uh, what we could be up against if we, don't have a, a long rotation uh, right. to try and prevent some of these issues that are happening elsewhere to to be more or less invited in our door. So, now, in, in our discussion, I think you and I have concurred that we would both like to um, extend rotation, that is expand the palette from which growers are choosing. Um, can you help me with some of the reasons maybe uh, that some of these other crops we have grown in the past have not had the traction in in your areas as elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So I get you and I agreed in our previous on conversations that we are we would love to see a four year rotation on say especially on canola mm -hmm. uh, and probably alternating uh, cereal broadleaf cereal broadleaf going yeah, back exactly to yeah exactly um, yeah which has the nice uh, rotational aspect of higher residue, lower residue crop. Um, there are also some uh, herbicide implications that you will have a better handle on some of the perennial weed problems if you're yep. able to go with that kind of a rotation. Yeah, um, but some of the reasons that some of these, like I, I liked your slide where you look back to was it 2009 or so 10 years uh, yeah you look back 10 years and you see how we used to grow a lot more especially barley and there was some more field peas back in the day as well yeah um, and even oats mm -hmm. some of those crops 
didn't succeed overly well for us around here because we got into some wetter years and yes. especially barley and field peas just don't do very well in those scenarios. No. Um, the one and that's advantage where, of, another advantage of field peas though is that you can get them in early and capitalize on what moisture is there often and also exactly. have them off before we run into wet conditions in the fall. Yeah. Some of the first things to be harvested. Yeah. And I, I should point out that I think there was a bit of a silver lining for those that did grow barley this year. I said how um, we're often hearing that maltsters are prejudiced against Manitoba. There's actually a fairly significant level of malt selection from uh, Manitoba this year because our neighbors to the west, Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, had an even harder problem with wet weather setting in early on and they yeah. did not get malt quality. So quite a bit was selected this year. Yeah. I also gave oats kind of short shrift or no mention in my talk. Um, but other than say bacterial blight and um, crown rust, which are periodic problems, oats is a crop that uh, I think really has a fit still in, in Manitoba. And as long as it doesn't get uh, too wet, we can grow good oats here. And um, it is having a bit of a resurgence as well throughout the province. Yes, it is. And one of the, if there's anything we, we, would, we could argue we had against oats in this corner of the province, it is we are, we're in a, a bit more distance to millers and, uh, and the bulkiness of the crop keep some yeah. guys away from it as well but uh we're trying to look we're trying to look beyond obstacles and see what potential that these crops have to try and mm -hmm. improve on rotation before we um before we put them aside i guess yeah so but uh that's good um i think we'll leave it at this david we are right. we are um hoping to uh get together with you and um, Tammy Jones later this month, if we can, uh, in the month of November, if we can schedule uh, a mm -hmm. follow-up meeting so growers can actually talk to you guys face-to-face -face yep. and see if we can get a conversation going about this and see if we can, is there a silver lining in a rotation we can work towards? I'm not anticipating anybody uh, throwing everything out they've learned over 20 or 30 year farming career to get yeah, into yeah. a four year rotation tomorrow. But yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. It's always been a moving target. And of course, and the, the needle will move slowly, but um, when we talk favorably about some of the other crops and how they can uh, reduce the disease problems in the crops that we're really relying on. And we know we don't want to, uh, overdo it with those crops because then we will have to make decisions towards other crops that might not routinely be as profitable exactly yeah and it yeah like exactly what you're saying it's a matter of tweaking what we're doing before we're forced to doing it mm -hmm. so um but i want to thank you david for taking the time to go over this with us today and uh if we have any follow-up questions come in, I'll make sure to forward them to you and uh, hopefully we'll uh, all connect later in the month. Okay, excellent. Thanks, David. Thanks, Karen.